All right, happy Saturday morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the fourth lecture of the 2020 Saturday Physics for Everyone lecture series, sponsored by the Department of Physics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. My name is Patrick Snyder. I'm coordinator of this series and also serve as recruiter for the physics department. And today I'm happy to present to you the fourth lecture of the series, uh, which is designed to give high schoolers and the general public the opportunity to hear from world-class scientists and researchers on the modern aspects of physics and how physics relates to the broader world around us. Now, the next talk will be on December 5th at 10.15 a.m., presented by Lindsay Olson, former artist-in-residence at Fermilab, and Dr. Kirsty Duffy, experimental physicist at Fermilab. And they will be presenting a talk entitled Arts, Science, and the Elegant Universe. So once again, I'll invite all those arts, artists and science lovers to attend this highly interdisciplinary presentation. And as a bonus, after today's session from 12 to 12.45, we'll be hosting a future physicist panel for high schoolers thinking about majoring in physics or engineering. And this panel will include former, current and former students of our department and will be moderated by yours truly. And furthermore, I know we had two wonderful professors from Ramon, our department on this webinar, who would be happy to also answer any questions about our program or department during this session from a faculty perspective. Now for today, let me give you a little breakdown of how today's event will go. First, I'll present to you Professor Yoni Khan, a faculty sponsor for the Saturday Physics for Everyone program, and he'll introduce today's speaker, Professor, ja Professor Jackie Narona Hostler. And today's session is scheduled to last until 1130 Central Time, and it will include a Q&A session at the end of the talk. So questions and comments will be taken from the attendees of today's presentation. So I encourage all of you to submit your questions by clicking the chat or Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. So without further ado, let me present to you theoretical physicist and faculty sponsor of Saturday Physics for Everyone, Professor Yoni Khan. Thanks, Patrick, and uh, good morning, everyone. I guess one of the advantages of having doing everything over Zoom um, in the pandemic era is that you don't even have to go outside and get wet in the rain on your way to, to Lewis Lab to hear the lecture. So um, I'm speaking to you from the very warm comfort of my basement. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Professor Jackie Naranya Hosler. Um, she is a theoretical nuclear physicist at the University of Illinois. She joined the faculty last year, the same, same year that I did. Um, so she got her PhD from the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, she did postdocs at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, Columbia University, University of Houston. And then prior to coming to Illinois, uh, she was uh, part of the physics and astronomy department at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, she's the winner of a number of awards, including the Alfred Sloan Fellowship, the Department of Energy Early Career Award, um, and then her service to the community also includes serving on the American Physical Society's Division of Nuclear Physics um, Executive Committee. So with uh, Jackie's very provocative um, and interesting title, I'll let you take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Yoni. Um, so let me get this set up. Very good. So it's very nice to be here. Good morning to everybody. And I'm gonna be talking to you about one of my favorite subjects in the world, and that is the most perfect liquid. And so I like to think about this as reverse alchemy. In this case, we're turning gold into the most perfect liquid. So to kind of show you this, I found this alchemy table of syllables and we want to flip everything around. We don't want to take lead instead of turning it into gold. We want to turn it into the most perfect liquid. And this most perfect liquid is called the quark gluon plasma. I'm going to explain all these details to you, but I just kind of want to show you the idea is how do we turn gold into this really, really crazy and bizarre liquid. And so first, before we do that, we need to understand a lot about how uh, fluid dynamics works. So in fact, I said liquid so far, but it's a little bit of sloppy language. What we really mean is a fluid. And to kind of explain what the difference between a liquid and a fluid are, let's go back to some of the basics. Uh, we know that there's different states of matter. So there's a solid, that's ice here. There's a liquid, that's water. And we have gas, water vapor, right? So liquid really is one of the states of matter. Whereas a fluid are equations fluid dynamics specifically are equations that can describe the movement, movement of a liquid, or it could actually describe other things. It could describe the movement of water vapor as well. 
And here's a nice example of something that is described by fluid dynamics. You can see this beautiful picture here on the right. Um, but the basic idea here is that it flows. Like this is the way it moves. It can describe as something that's flowing in time. And so in the beginning, I kind of was a little sloppy with the language, but really what we're talking here is about the most perfect fluid. So to understand what a fluid is, let's, let's talk about that. Um, like I said, as it flows, we can think of water going down a lake, the way it moves, there's very specific equations that can describe that movement. Uh, we can think of waves, we can think of currents, all of that can be described by fluid dynamics. And so this is one of the key basics of what it means to be a fluid. Another idea of what a fluid is, is that it cannot resist some sort of outside shearing force. So the idea is basically they threw a water balloon and a big bowling ball. And you can see bowling ball is obviously a solid. You see the water balloon, which is a liquid and can be shrived through fluid dynamics. When it hits it, it has this like beautiful rippling behavior that's occurring is because it cannot withstand that force. It just kind of melds around it. It flows around it is what you're seeing here. And it's a really nice example of the difference between a solid and a liquid. Another property of a fluid is that it takes the shape of a container. Uh, there's no permanent shape to it. In fact, whatever container you put it in, it's just going to conform to that shape. If I would take this water and pull it, pour it into a different container, it would have a different shape. And every time you, you re-pour it, it would just take on the, the properties or take on the, the shape of the container that you're pouring it into. So now this part's a little bit more complicated. We need to re- think about what are the actual variables that we use to describe a fluid. Um, and so typically, if you've taken a little bit of physics, you might know about mass, you might know about forces. These are things that we could use to describe more Newtonian physics. Um, you can think of like a rock or a ball being projected, uh, projected through the air. But in fact, when we're talking about fluids, we need to think about different sort of variables. So we would think about density. For instance, we call this rho. And all this is, is the mass divided by the volume. And so I give an example, if we have, we go back to this idea of a balloon, we could have something with a low density or a small density. That means that if all these particles have identical masses, that you have fewer particles within the volume of the balloon. Whereas a large density is you have many, many, many of these particles within the balloon. So this is to help you kind of picture what a density means. Um, you know, if just to give you some examples, if you have the exact same shape, if you had something like lead versus something with the exact same shape filled with air, the thing filled with air would have a, less of a density and the thing with lead would have a much larger density. So this is one of the, the variables that we use to describe fluids. Um, the other one that we need to talk about is called pressure. And so pressure is the force divided by the area. And so in fact, the way we would define this, we're gonna area, I think we all can kind of figure out what this is, but the, the force in fact is gonna be the change in momentum versus time where the momentum is the mass times the velocity. So if we keep everything fixed, if we keep the area fixed, we keep the mass fixed and we keep the time fixed, but we're changing our velocity, something that has a smaller velocity has a lower momentum. And so this is kind of, again, we're going back to balloon. We have four particles. We say they're all the same mass. They're in the same area. But here they have a lower velocity. So they're moving much slower inside this balloon. Then that, mean, that means they have a smaller pressure. However, if they're moving much more quickly, like double the, the velocity, then you have a larger pressure. And so you can think about like how many times are these little particles hitting the sides of the wall? If they're moving much faster, they're going to be hitting the side of the wall much more quickly. And that means they have a larger pressure. So these are the type of variables that we use when we describe a fluid. Now, the next kind of question that one always gets is, when is fluid dynamics applicable? Like I said, is that we could describe a liquid or a gas with fluid dynamics. So we need to understand when is a good time to actually use these equations that would describe a fluid. And so one of the fundamental principles there is that you need to have a large separation of scales. So if we think about a lake, right? I think we all would agree that this seems like a fluid. So we can think of Lake Michigan, for instance. 
And the large scale is just the size of the lake, right? So if we look at that, that's around 500,000 meters across. I looked it up on Wikipedia shortly before this talk. And then we want to think about what is the small scale inside the lake. And so if we think about the smallest scale of water, we think about H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen, that little tiny molecule. And so if we take that, so the small scale divided by the large scale, then we can get a very, what is called a Knudsen number. And so this Knudsen number measures how applicable is fluid dynamic equations. So we need a very, very tiny Knudsen number. That means we have a large separation between the small scale and the large scale. And so when we get a tiny Knudsen number, then we say, okay, we can describe this with fluid dynamics. And we're all happy with that. Um, and in fact, when we do that calculation, just kind of a back of the envelope estimate, it gets to be 10 to the minus 17, which is a very, very, very tiny number. I think we can all agree on this. Now, I should be a little bit more precise with my language. It's not actually the size of the H2O molecule, but it's rather the distance before a, one um, molecule of water hits something else. But to say the size of the molecule is not a horrible estimate for this, just to get sort of an order of magnitude estimate. So the idea is when can we apply fluid dynamics is really when we have a very, very tiny Knudsen number, or in other words, when we have a large separ separation between the large scale and the small scale. And in fact, we use fluid dynamics in so many different things. They're extremely use useful equations, um, and, and we use them in much more things than just, you know, liquids and in just talking about gases. But one thing that I always find fascinating that traffic jams, for instance, can be described quite well by fluid dynamics. And you can see here that there's different intersection points. And this is in fact described by a fluid, these fluid dynamic equations. So even things like cars and people can be described through fluid dynamics. It's just fascinating how that works. Uh, another really good example of something that can be described by fluid dynamics, you can see the um, flow of blood through the body. And so this is something where fluid dynamics has been quite useful when it comes to biology. And then if you've been paying attention maybe to some recent news, there's this thing called neutron star mergers where you have two basically dead stars that are very, very far away. They rotate around each other and they collide. And the part where they're colliding can be described by fluid dynamics as well. So you're getting this huge range of different types of systems that still can be described well by fluid dynamics. There are certain assumptions. I mean, there's little differences, of course, between something that happens in a neutron star and blood throwing th uh, flowing through the body, but the basic concepts are still there and they're still described by fluid dynamics. So what kind of equations can we use to describe fluid dynamics? I'm going to write down the equation here, but you don't have to worry. You don't have to know all the math or what all of these little uh, functions here. I'm going to explain the basic idea to you all. You might not know what this, this weird shape thing here, which is called a nabla, is, but that's OK. I want to just tell you what the basic ingredients that go into this and, and what does that mean. So this thing here, these equations, are called the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is what we use to describe fluids that are not moving at the speed of light. What happens at the speed of light, I'll get to later on. Um, but right now, for something that's not moving at the speed of light, you know, water going down a stream, anything like that, we can describe it with fluid dynamic equations, and that works really well. And so they have essentially three different components here. This first one, this row here, is the density, which we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, how dense your system is or not. This P is the pressure that we talked about before. The Vs are the velocity. And I'll get to this eta in a second. But anyways, this first term here, you have the density times what this essentially is, is how quickly your, your velocity is changing. So if your, your fluid is accelerating or, or slowing down, um, that is what this first term is. So we can figure out if the fluid speeds up or slows down essentially with this first term. But to do that, we also need to consider these other terms. Now, this term here, this little funny symbol with the pressure, that's something that describes the gradients of your system. And if you don't know what a gradient is, that's OK. We can kind of see this when we look at this mountain. So let's imagine that I'm standing at the top of this mountain, and I roll a bowling ball 
down this mountain, right? So the bowling ball goes down here and you can imagine it has a pretty steep slope. It's gonna start going very, very fast as it goes down here. So this means it has a large gradient when it goes here. So this value here would be very large. Now you see here, it reaches a plateau. And if it goes here, it would slow down. It has less of a gradient during this flat region. And so that's the same idea here, is this sort of term would become smaller when it's getting a flat part. And then let's say it rolls all the way here and go, and that would become very large again. So this is the idea of gradients, is you're doing this, you know, some sort of 3D space, as you can see here, like this hill that you're rolling down, um, except for in this case, you're talking about pressure gradients. So you're thinking of locally, if you have a large pressure or a small pressure, but it's the exact same concept of seeing how things would change depending on your local pressure. Now, this last term, this might be something that's, that's less familiar to you, but we're going to talk about in detail. So don't worry if you don't know what it means. Basically, we're looking at this coefficient here. This is called eta, and it has to do with the viscosity. And so what is the viscosity? It's kind of telling you how sticky a substance is. Um, something like honey has a very, very large viscosity, or something like water has a much smaller viscosity. And I'll give you a lot of examples about that. So don't worry if you don't know what that means. But if you combine all of these different pieces of the equation together, you can describe fluids very well. So I want to show you a little bit about how viscosity affects your system. If you have something with a large viscosity, it would actually slow down your system, it would prevent flow within your system. Whereas if you have a small viscosity, you can flow really, really well. Um, so just imagine like you had a river full of honey versus a river full of water. The river full of water, you'll be able to flow very quickly down, whereas the river full of honey would, would be very, very slow. A boat going down that river wouldn't get very far. And so I have a quick demo to show you. Um, on the left here, this is water. And so it has a low viscosity, whereas here, you have a substance that has a large viscosity. And so you can see, I'm going to drop two balls down here, and you can see which one wins. You see the one with the water goes down immediately to the bottom, whereas the one on the right with a much larger viscosity, <laughs> look how slow that guy is going. It's going to take forever to get to the bottom. Um, I'm not going to show you all the way to the bottom, but let's just say it's going to take a very long time thanks to this large viscosity. It's preventing it from flowing in the system. All right. So um, I, I kind of introduced a lot of ideas about fluid dynamics. Maybe this is a good time before I take fluid dynamics to the extreme to see if there's any questions just on the general idea of fluid dynamics. Patrick, are there any questions? Yeah, uh, Clint asks, um, I, I think early on, uh, mm -hmm. but wouldn't the water balloon pop from the force of the ball? Yeah, it, it definitely pops. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, I think there's a video on YouTube that you can see this. It, it absolutely pops eventually, but for a while it still holds and you can see this beautiful rippling motion. And in fact, I have a really cool demo for everyone at the end of this talk that does involve water balloon popping. So just hold your horses and you'll get to see it soon. <laughs> yeah, great. Also from Clinton, he said, a river full of honey would be very yummy. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> All right. So if there's nothing else, then let's continue onwards. Um, I talked about kind of standard fluid dynamics, but now I want to take everything to the extreme. I'm a physicist and I'm always interested at what sort of crazy scenarios that we can come up with. So the first thing I want to ask is what happens when a fluid moves at the speed of light? Right? So we know that there's a limit in terms of how fast some sort of object can move. And so what happens when all of a sudden you have some fluid and it's getting really, really close to the speed of light? One thing that happens is we have to rewrite our equations. We cannot use what I call these Navier-Stokes equations anymore. There's a lot of problems with them and I'll, I'll kind of go through some of those details with you. Um, but we had to invent new equations. They're called Israel-Stewart. And there's two key points that the Navier-Stokes break down. And I'll show you that in the next slide or two. So one of the issues is something called causality. Essentially, you can't have anything moving faster than the speed of light, right? 
So if you think about some sort of fluid dynamics equations, if you have something like I hit the system, you know, if you think about like a, a ball or, or a pebble dropping into the fluid on one side, you need to make sure that on the other side, that it doesn't, when it goes from one point A to point B, that doesn't travel faster than the speed of light, right? Um, but when your fluid's already moving really, really close to the speed of light, this is in fact a big problem is that th this idea of, of violating causality or moving faster than the speed of light using fluid dynamics is something that is, is really hard to deal with. And in fact, if you take the Navier-Stokes Navier equations and just put in a velocity that, that is almost at the speed of light and you just run it, you just solve it on a computer, you'll find that in fact it does violate causality. So this is a huge issue is, is we need to figure out a way to deal with this. If you perturb the system over here, you hit it, it cannot move faster or, or signal over to the other half of the system faster than the speed of light. So we need to take care of that. So that's, that's the first issue. The second issue is the idea of stability. Is let's go back to that idea that I have some sort of fluid, it's moving at the speed of light, and then you know I poke it, right? Or I drop something in it, how does the fluid deal with this sort of, you know, when I'm disturbing it, I'm bothering this fluid? Well, there's kind of three different things you could happen. One, it could be stable. So this is just like if I drop a pebble into a pond, you see it is affected at first, there's some ripples, but over time it eventually goes back to normal and it smooths out, right? So that's a stable system, that's what we want. You could have a neutral system. So this is like a bowl on a table. If I flick it, maybe it's gonna fall off the edge, maybe not. That's, it's neutral, right? It's something in between. Or you could have an unstable system. You can think of something where I've balanced the ball just perfectly on this round surface. This is over here on the right. And if I flick it, it's gonna go off the deep end. It's The system's gonna be destroyed. It's not gonna work. Uh, and we don't want that. We don't want, if we like poke a fluid moving at the speed of light, that everything breaks down. That would be bad. And so that's another issue with these Navier-Stokes equations is that if you put in velocities, that are near the speed of light, it's not stable. And in fact, your equations are just gonna break down if you try and solve them, and that's not gonna work. So we need to find a way to get around that. And so these, these two guys, Israel Stewart did this back in the 70s. They suggested that we add something called a relaxation time. Now, if this term seems unfamiliar to you, that's okay. Basically what it is, is that if you have some sort of system, and specifically if it has some sort of viscosity in it, you need to have some period of time that the system takes to go back to equilibrium. So by equilibrium, what I mean is if you think of a pond, it's just completely still, right? But if I, it's out of equilibrium, I've dropped this pebble in the pond, you can see right here where the waves are rippling outwards. So you need some sort of time from when you've dropped this pebble in the pond for it to go back to its kind of steady state, its equilibrium state. And this in fact fixes the things. It makes the equations certainly much more complicated, but it, it, they are then causal and they are then stable. And so this makes our lives better. And then we can actually go and solve them and learn cool things about what happens when a fluid moves at the speed of light. Okay, so that's one thing that I like to look at as extreme, but let's think of other sort of extreme scenarios that we could um, make happen to fluids. So what happens if we heat them up a lot? And what happens if it's in fact, not just a little bit of a high temperature, but the hottest temperatures on earth? In fact, there was a Guinness Book of World Records for, for doing this. Um, anyway, so if we think of like a volcano, this is actually significantly cold. Like to me, this is almost zero temperature in terms of the temperatures that I'm normally thinking about. If you think about the sun, it's also extremely, extremely cold compared to the temperatures that I'm thinking about. Um, in fact, the temperatures that these, this fluid is at are 10 to the 12th Kelvin. This is the hottest thing that we've ever created on earth. It's extraordinarily hot. And so what happens when you heat up a fluid to these extreme temperatures? And in fact, what happens is that the molecules like H2O are no longer the smallest pieces of this fluid that matter. In fact, we're looking at a whole new different small scale. It's really the building blocks of matter. These are things called quarks and gluons. And so again, I give you like an artistic rendering of what that could look like. These balls here are the quarks and this kind of 
goopy stringy thing in between are called the gluons. And I'm going to explain to you much more about what those things are. So don't worry if you've never heard these terms, but just trust me that there are the smallest little pieces of matter that we are aware of. Um, and then kind of the last question, we've, we've looked at what happens when a fluid moves at the speed of light. We've looked at what happens when we heat up a fluid to really, really high temperatures. What about the smallest fluid, right? What happens, we know our small scale is on the order of like maybe quarks and gluons, but what happens when you take your large scale, it's no longer the size of Lake Michigan, but rather it's very, very, very tiny as well. And then all of a sudden, this idea of separation of scales starts to become very tricky. Um, so we have our Knudsen numbers here. And we know for the Lake Michigan, that worked really well. It was way, way, way small. Um, and so we could say that that was a fluid. But what happens when our fluid is about the size of a nucleus? That's 10 to the minus 14 meters. That's insanely tiny. Um, and that's our large scale. And yet our small scale are quarks and gluons. So I'm not really going to tell you the answer of that quite yet, because I need to tell you a little bit more about what quarks and gluons are first. But I just want to put this idea in your head that we could have very, very tiny droplets of fluid, and we want to understand what that means and how we can study those things. So I'm a greedy physicist. I want to look at everything at the most extreme possible. And so the question is, why not all three? Why can't I just shove them all into the same system and study them all at once? And that's in fact what I do, is there's just something called the quark gluon plasma. It's created at the highest temperatures on Earth. It's the smallest system possible. Like I said, it's about the size of a nucleus, if not even much smaller. And it flows at ultra relativistic speeds. And in fact, to, to, to get a quark gluon plasma, you need something going about 99.99999% the speed of light. So it's going really fast. Uh, and this is, again, another sort of rendering of what this looks like. In fact, it's so tiny that nobody can take pictures of it, right? We can only do measurements of it. And so the idea of these kind of white globes are the nucleus, and they come and they hit each other, and inside you have this quark gluon plasma. So we're gonna talk quite a bit about this, this really bizarre fluid and how we get to it um, in a minute. But I will tell you that, like I said, it's really weird. Uh, we have the Guinness Book of World Records for reaching the hottest temperatures on earth. And in fact, it's the smallest fluid that we know of. There's been a lot of studies on this effect. Uh, it's the most perfect fluid. So I'll get to that in, a, sec uh, in a, uh, a second, but the idea is it has a very, very small viscosity. So it flows really, really well. Um, and in fact, it may be the strangest fluid. I'm not 100% certain about that one, but it is very, very strange. Um, and then the other thing too, and I won't get it to in this talk, but this is something really recent in the field, is it has like these very tiny miniature tornadoes, but they are really, really spinning very, very fast. In fact, much, much more than any tornado um, that we know of on Earth. But to understand all of this, so to understand the quark gluon plasma, we first need to understand something about what's called the strong force and quantum chromodynamics. So I'm gonna to explain to you what those things mean. All right, so you may know that there's four forces in nature. There's the strong force. This is from the name. We're very creative as physicists. It's the strongest force in nature, but it doesn't affect things on a large scale. It's really on the scale of a proton or a nucleus. It's very, very tiny systems. You have electromagnetism. You know, this is dealing with magnets, electricity. Um, this is something you use in your day-to-day -day life. You have the weak force. This also is something that's on a very small scale, but it's much weaker. Um, and for this talk, I'm, I'm pretty much going to ignore the weak force. And then last, you have gravity. And I think we all have a good intuitive sense of what gravity does, you know, going back to the idea of dropping an apple on Earth and whatnot. Although the reality is it's much more complicated than that. Um, however, because I'm dealing with things that are so, so, so tiny, gravity doesn't play a big role there. All right, so to get at the strong force, we need to understand a little bit about scales. Um, I told you before that no longer are we dealing with molecules, but we're dealing with something much, much smaller than molecules. And in fact, we're not even dealing with atoms. This is a picture here of an atom here. 
you have your electrons flying around the outside. In the inside, you have the nucleus. This is around the size of 10 to the minus 10 meters. It's extraordinarily tiny. But that is actually a huge scale for me. In fact, what I look at is this thing, this little ball in the center, which is called a nucleus. And you can see this, this ball here, which is much smaller. It's 10 to the minus 14 meters. And these little balls here are protons and neutrons. And in fact, if you were to take one of those and crack them open, you would see that they're full of these little tiny, tiny elementary particles called quarks here and gluons. And I'll explain to you what quarks and gluons do. But just know it's on a very tiny scale. So the proton is around 10 to the minus 15 meters. And the quarks and gluons are about on the order of 10 to the minus 19 meters. That's insanely tiny. Um, and to kind of give you perspective of how far this is away from us, like, you know, a human's about one meter tall, more or less. Um, if you take that scale, it's a about the same distance away to the nearest star as we are from you know, a proton or quarks and gluons. So the nearest star is 10 to the 16th meters. So it's about the same distance of trying to find what's going on on these very, very tiny scales. Now to do these things, um, physicists don't like to have to deal with too many units. It makes our lives complicated. We wanna just deal with the equations directly. So what we do is something called natural units. That means that my speed of light actually say is one because everything I'm dealing with is, is at nearly the speed of light. So if I had to carry all those extra digits, it would take a lot of time. Um, and that makes you know this famous equation from Einstein, E equals MC squared, just means energy is equal to mass. So that makes my life much easier. Um, I talk about everything in different length scales than most people. I would talk about femtometers, which is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So that's about the size of a proton. I talk about temperatures that are 11 billion Kelvins. That's the temperature scale that I'm typically talking about. And for masses though, it's very, very tiny. So the mass that I would be thinking of is around 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. So very, very tiny masses. So how does this all fit together? Well, there's this thing called the standard model. And this combines the strong force, the weak force, and electromagnetism into one model here. But the part that I really care about are essentially these guys here. These are called the quarks. We have six different quarks. And for most of my talk, I'll be focusing on this up quark and down quark. These are the lightest quarks, but they're really in basically all the matter that we see around us. And there are other interesting quarks as well. The strange quark. Remember when I said that we have the strangest fluid maybe? We have a lot of strange quarks in it. That's what I mean. But we also have charm quarks, top and bottom, which also have a lot of interesting things So I won't be able to talk about in this talk. And then we also have this gluon. And let me explain to you a little bit about what the gluon does. So the gluon is essentially how the different quarks talk to each other. Right? So I don't know if you played with this as a kid, but you could take two tin, tin cans and you can um, put a string between them and use them like a telephone. So you might know this. And so that's very similar. The string is very similar to what gluons do, um, is they, they are mediating. They're helping these quarks talk to each other. Now, the problem is, though, that the gluons like not just talking to the quarks, but they like talking to each other as well. There's something where these gluons are also communicating with each other, and that makes things get all entangled up. Um, so for those, this might date me a little bit, but you know, we had these phones back in the day with these long cords and they'd get all tangled up. It's very similar to what happens with the gluons as they interact with each other, talk to each other, and they kind of make this, this messy, complicated thing. And that actually drives a lot of the interesting physics is this, this you know, confusion, this, all, this, all this communication between the gluons. So there is an underlying theory that describes all of this. It's called quantum chromodynamics, or QCD. And this theory describes two different things. And I'm going to explain what these things are in a second. It describes something called confinement and hadrons. You probably don't know what that terms are yet, but we're going to get to those in a second. But it's essentially the theory that describes how quarks and gluons, how they interact with each other. Um, and it received the Nobel Prize back in 2004. 
And here's a nice sort of simulation. You can see some quarks here. The squiggly line is describing a gluon. And it, it shows how some people solve this theory of quantum chromodynamics. But it has two fundamental principles. So let's go into those two principles behind quantum chromodynamics. One of those principles are that gluons glue together. These are called hadrons. So remember, I talked about a proton. I talked about neutrons. These are all hadrons. Basically, the idea is, is that you don't have a quark or a gluon running around by themselves, but they're always stuck together. So they're either stuck together in sets of three, or there's this is a quark anti-quark. So this is a set of two. There could potentially be much more complicated things, but these are very hard to measure and there's still a lot of questions surrounding them. But the idea is, is that we have a, a large menagerie of particles that we can produce. So we have, when there's just two quarks, it's actually a quark anti-quark, it's called a meson. And when you have three quarks, it's called a baryon. And so these are these kind of particles they are always stuck together. And we can't then measure the quarks and gluons directly. We're always seeing um, these hadrons instead. So like a proton and a neutron, instead of just seeing the individual quarks and gluons. And so this idea is called confinement. Basically, that there's no free quarks. It's like, let's say I had a quark anti-quark pair and I wanted to like, I could just pull them apart with my hands and try and separate them. And in fact, what would happen is the more and more I try and pull a quark and anti-quark pair apart, the harder and harder it gets. And in fact, it's easier instead of just pulling them apart is to create an entirely new quark and anti-quark pair from the vacuum. And that's what's shown here is that you try to pull these two quarks apart. And in fact, there's created two new quarks instead. It was easier to do that than actually pull these guys apart. As so I don't know if you ever played with those finger traps as a kid, but if you try and pull your fingers out of them, the more you pull, the harder you get. It's the same sort of concept here. And so what's causing that to happen? Well, it's this idea of gluons. These gluons stick together. And it's in fact, this, this whole thing with the gluons communicating with each other that makes it so hard to pull apart quarks. So that's great and all, but how does that influence us, right? So we're humans, we can't see quarks and gluons. They're always stuck inside of things. Why should I care about that? Well, in fact, the reason you should care about that is when it comes to things like me, you, my laptop that I'm talking on you right now, these interactions from quarks and gluons have a big effect on the mass. So let's actually do the calculation. Uh, let's take this adult panda here. Uh, I, so I think she weighs around 200 pounds. Let's figure out how much of her mass is coming from uh, QCD. And so, in fact, if you do the calculation, about 95% of visible matter, so this, some of the estimates are, are 95, 99, it's around this range, um, of visible matter comes from QCD. So this is really the interactions of gluons, either with each other or with quarks. Uh, and so you might have also heard of the Higgs, well, some people call it the God particle, but the idea is there is it gives the mass of just the quarks and not these, these interactions between quarks and gluons. So you can kind of separate the mass of the universe into two different pockets. And if you do that calculation, if you calculated the mass of a proton, for instance, um, just by its quarks versus what is left, so that's all this gluon interaction, so that's really driving from quantum chromodynamics, you find that about 99% of the mass of the proton is really from the interactions of quarks and gluons. It's not from these quarks themselves. So that's the quarks themselves would be called the Higgs mass versus the QCD mass, which is coming from the interactions of gluons with quarks or themselves. And so if you do that for a panda, in this case, I think I did the estimate of like 95%, but you see that the vast majority of the mass of the panda is from quantum chromodynamics. It's really from these interactions of gluons that's giving the mass to the panda. And, and in fact, everything that we can see around us is like that. Things that we can't see, dark matter, whole nother ball game. But for the things that we can see around us, most of this is coming from quantum chromodynamics. All right, so uh, I'm gonna stop here briefly and see if there's other questions.
Yeah, so we have a few. Um, so Courtney asked, I think this was right after we, we finished the last question mm -hmm. section. Uh, when rolling that, that bowling ball down that hill, you were talking about different pressures. Uh, she has different pressures of what? Ah, okay. So the bowling ball was more of an example of how we had different gradients. But when we talk about fluid dynamics in terms of different pressures, it would be different pressures within the fluid itself. Um, and, and so you might actually have some idea of this from if you ever watch the, the weather channel, you hear high pressure, low pressure regions. Um, and, and that's exactly they're using fluid dynamics to describe how weather patterns move across the sky. Um, and yeah. so you could have high pressure regions and then they would have a lot of stuff moving out, lot, large flow coming from those high pressure regions. Yeah, essentially flow of air molecules, right? Exactly, yeah. Yep, okay, great. So, and then uh, Clint just kind of mentioned just a few comments, uh, 10 to the 12th Kelvin is rather pitiful when you look at the core of a neutron star or a quark star. Actually, um, no, it's, 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 it's higher. So uh, the temperatures from a, a neutron star, the maximum, uh, it's something like 100 MeV, which is around 10 to the 12th Kelvin. Um, but in fact, ours is, when we do this, what I'm going to show here is about three times, sometimes six times higher than that. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and so you were, uh, Michael said, the um, you're referring to small tornadoes or the vortices. Is there an analogy with tornadoes and hurricanes in our atmosphere? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very sort of, it's very similar. Um, like I said, we can't use exactly the same equations because all of this stuff is moving at the speed of light. So in terms of getting these equations for these small like tornadoes, essentially in this fluid, it's still an open question in the field. We can measure them experimentally and say, hey, this seems weird. We seem to be seeing these like little tornadoes, um, but we, we have a hard time actually describing that with the equations themselves. But it, it's, it's definitely the same. It's the same analogy between them. Okay, okay. And then Clint also mentioned um, uh, strange quarks lead to the end of the universe. Any comments on that? Uh, so this is this is for strangelets, which is a bit different. Um, this would some people think that there could be potentially strange quark stars. Um, so far, there has been no measurements of those, but we can definitely measure strange particles that that we measure constantly all the time. Um, so if I and I'll get to this a bit more of how we experimentally measure a lot of these things. Uh, but if I look at the number of particles that come out experimentally about 10% of them are strange. It's just that they're always created in pairs. So you always have the same same number of strange and anti-strange particles and eventually they decay over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, just one last one mm -hmm. and then I'll let you go. Uh, Kara mentioned um, when you were kind of making that analogy with the finger, two fingers coming together in a quark and anti-quark, mm -hmm. if you push them together, will they come apart? Oh yeah, so that is an excellent question. And in fact, yes, this is called asymptotic freedom. And that is exactly what we're going to be talking about next. So okay, thank you great. very much for that nice question. All right, so let's continue onwards. And, and in fact, this goes exactly with this slide is we know about different phase transitions of water, right? If we go to very cold temperatures, we have ice here. At some point, we hit a temperature where we add a bunch of heat. It's a fixed temperature and we change the properties into a liquid. We continue to add heat over time. And then again, we fit we hit another temperature, everything stays flat, we keep adding heat, and we change into a gas, so water vapor. So let's let's think about this. What happens if we heat up quarks and gluons enough? Could we actually reach a high enough temperature where we could deconfine quarks and gluons? So exactly this question is like, if we reach a high enough temperature, could we think about some sort of weird substance where the main things are quarks and gluons. They're no longer bound with inside a hadron or a proton. Uh, and so that's exactly into that, that very nice question that we had. And so let's take this further. Is that possible? Can we reach a temperature where they're deconfined? And this is in fact what we call the quark gluon plasma, it is a, some sort of plasma where the, the quarks and gluons are no longer stuck together inside a hadron. And so this is kind of a cartoon. Uh, it's got a lot going on. I just want to tell you the basics of this is that up here at extremely high temperatures, we have this quark gluon plasma. And all this is showing you is how we can measure it in different regions. 
Um, so you see we're at really, really high temperatures. This is around 10 to the 12 Kelvin. Um, and in fact, we believe the early universe was filled with a quark gluon plasma at one point. I'll get to that in a second. We also have experiments on Earth that can measure the quark gluon plasma. There's the Large Hadron Collider. There's something called the Relative Physics Heavy Ion Collider. And if you go to lower temperatures, in fact, you would have neutron star mergers and neutron stars. So this goes back to the other question about do, would um, neutron stars have higher temperatures? In fact, you see there in, in these units around 100 MeV. If you go to the Large Hadron Collider, it's around 600 MeV in the maximum temperatures we've been able to reach on Earth. So it's about six times um, hotter than a neutron star. So this is kind of the idea of how we measure these things is we can look either to the early universe, we can look at nuclear experiments um, on Earth, or we can look within neutron stars as well. So like I said, is we believe there was a phase of matter in the early universe it was around 10 to the minus six seconds after the Big Bang. So it wasn't very long lived. However, the entire universe was a quark gluon plasma. And so this was the idea that you had essentially, you know, deconfined quarks and gluons. They were no longer stuck within hadrons. And you can see this in this picture here um, of, of the early universe. Now, it wasn't very long lived, but on my time scales, in fact, that was a long period of time. Now, the problem is how far back in time can we see? Can we study that somehow from cosmology? And that's when we run into issues. Um, theoretically, we really believe that the early universe had a period of time where it was filled with the quark gluon plasma. However, if we look as far back in time as we can look, we have to look to the cosmic microwave background. And that only gives us around 10 to the fifth years after the Big Bang. So we really can't see far back in time enough to know for sure the properties of the quark gluon plasma. Right? We don't have ways to study this at this point, right? Because this happens so early on in the early universe. So what do we do? Well, like I said, is we want to take gold. Oh, I think these, these, this gold here, and we want to do reverse alchemy, is we want to take gold and turn this into the most perfect liquid or the most perfect fluid. So what do we do? Is we take these very, very large accelerators. Like we, I said, we have one, the Large Hadron Collider. We have the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, which I show here. And we accelerate two gold ions. So essentially, we take gold, we remove everything from it, just the tiniest speck of gold, remove all the electrons, and then we send them around these rings and smash them together at 99.9999% the speed of light. And this is how we reproduce basically a very tiny version of the Big Bang. We call these little bangs in the lab. And that's why we need such high temperatures because they're smashing together at such fast speeds. They reach very, very high temperatures. Okay, so I wanted to show you an example of this. There's two types of experiments. There's this collider one, but we can also do a fixed target. And that's something that we can kind of mock up locally. So this is here in Loomis in Illinois. And Erica, our specialist on demos, helped me make this like miniature version of what we do in the laboratory. Essentially, we did this, this following is we put a ping pong ball here on the right hand side. This is called a projectile. We're going to accelerate it really fast. And then over here on the left hand side is we put a water balloon. And so someone was asking me earlier on if we want to see water balloons explode. So we're going to go do that. So we're going to take our ping pong ball, accelerate it here, and it's going to hit our target and it's going to explode. And this is, in fact, one way that we are able to reproduce the quark gluon plasma as well, is we have a fixed target experiment where you would have like a very thin foil of gold and you have a very, very long tunnel and you accelerate something it could be like a gold ion or a beam actually of gold ions and they hit this foil and then we take measurements but of course this is what i'm showing you now is much slower than what we're doing in the actual laboratories so to show you what that looks like here's our tube i've accelerated the ping pong ball and you can see here it explodes right and that's actually it explodes so much it destroyed the ping pong ball and you can see from above this huge splash that is occurring this is kind of the same sort of idea of what we're seeing in our experiments is this huge splash that comes out. And then we look at the splash that happens afterwards and we learn about the quark gluon plasma. So in fact, this is an example that we have experimentalists locally here at Illinois that are on the Atlas experiment and they're doing exactly that. They're colliding 
two gold ions, and in fact, or in this case, it's two lead ions, but still, it's the same sort of idea. And you see all of these particles that splash outwards, and they have around their detectors that measure the properties of these particles. They look at their mass, they look at how fast they're moving, they see where they're at compared to each other, and that can give us enormous wealth of information. It gets hundreds of thousands of particles that splash out um, of this, this nearly perfect liquid. So to give you an idea of what this looks like is we can run simulations. So this is an example of a, a three-dimensional um, fluid moving at nearly a speed of light. And this is essentially what you're seeing is these two ions come in. In fact, in fact they look like flat pancakes because there's something called Lorentz contraction. Um, but this is what, what happens when something moves at the speed of light. It looks very thin. And so they hit each other like this. And you're going to see what happens after the point that they've hit each other. So they're spreading out. In fact, this is nearly at the speed of light. And you see this part here is where all the interesting physics is happening. It's going to cool down. It's got this kind of bumpy surface. This is called the transverse plane. Along the beam is kind of boring. It's just moving at the speed of light. But here, this circular region is where all the interesting physics happens. And I'm going to talk to you about that. So here's another simulation where we just focus on what I said is the transverse plane. So that round region, and we can see it cooling over time. So these are fluid dynamic simulations um, at the speed of light. These are solving Israel Stewart equations. I kind of mentioned that name earlier on. Um, but essentially what you're seeing is you're seeing it cooling down in time, expanding over time. And this is something that we can describe very, very well using numerical simulations. We run this all on high performance computers, sometimes on supercomputers. Um, it, it takes a lot of, of power to solve these equations, um, but we can get enormous amount of information from this. And in fact, they're very, very accurate at describing the experimental data. But before I kind of go into that, I wanna to talk to you a little bit more about fluids and what is a good fluid and a bad fluid. So I said we have nearly the most perfect fluid. Um, and what does that mean when I say it's a good fluid? Well, a good fluid means it flows. So that means it has a low viscosity. If you remember these two tubes that I was showing you before. So we think of water as a pretty good fluid. It flows, you can pour it into a glass, it works well. We think of something that is a bad fluid like tar or like honey that is just, you know, it doesn't flow well. It, it just kind of gets stuck, is clunky. Um, and so the best fluids are closest to what we call an ideal fluid. And so that means that the viscosity is nearly zero, almost zero. And so to kind of show you what I mean by that, what is viscosity? In this case, we're talking about a shear viscosity. So you have some sort of liquid here and you have some sort of force on the liquid, something pushing the liquid forward. But what would happen if it's on the top layer here, you have different velocities and how they are affected by these different layers. Um, and the amount that the fluid is affected by some sort of force is known as the shear viscosity. And so you can see liquids that we know or fluids that we know well, there's water here. We always think of that as a pretty good, good fluid. Um, we have helium, which is even a better fluid than water. For instance, here, you can see that as it goes to zero, that's a better and better fluid. So we would say helium is a better or more perfect fluid than water. And then we have way, way, way down here at nearly zero, the quark gluon plasma. And that's why we say that it's in the most perfect fluid known to humanity because it has such a tiny viscosity in it. Another thing that can happen with fluids is the idea of diffusion. And so I did this little demo where I put dye into a water and you can see how it spreads throughout the water. So this is basically how you're transferring the energy and momentum throughout throughout the, the fluid. This is something that we deal with also in the quark gluon plasma as well as we think of how it diffuses outwards. So what are the signatures? It's, it's something extremely hot, extremely tiny, moving at the speed of light. How in the world do I actually measure this? It seems like we're talking about Star Trek here and not something that anybody can just measure in their lab. Well, in fact, we, we can do just that. Um, one thing that we do is if we think about these two, remember these kind of circular regions that were, were hitting each other, these are the shape of a nucleus. 
and they have a certain impact region. There's a certain part where they collide. So you could think of like a collision of a car. Does it hit each other head on or on the side, anything like this? It's the same sort of idea, but on a very, very tiny scale. And so there's the region, this impact region here that forms a certain shape. And in general, it's a very elliptical shape, but there's also lots of bumps and wiggles in there. And we can describe all of this using fluid dynamics. And so what fluid dynamics does is you have here this elliptical shape and you have pressure gradients. Remember, I was talking to you about these gradients with the hill earlier on. This is what drives fluid dynamics. So you have these large pressure gradients and they push outwards. And so you can see this happening with the fluid over time. These are different snapshots of the energy over time and it spreads outwards here because of these large gradients. And in fact, you, what you end up with at the end of the day is you had somewhat of an elliptical shape here and you also get an elliptical shape here at the end of the day. And this is something, this elliptical shape is something that experimentalists can measure. And we can do direct comparisons between these fluid dynamic simulations and experiments doing that. And so to understand how we get at that, we can kind of think of the idea of harmonics. So you might have had something like sound waves or played with harmonics on a string. So we have like the first harmonic, the second harmonic, third harmonic, and fourth harmonic. We can do the same sort of things, but with geometry. And so what we do is we look at different harmonics for geometry. And so in fact, we write down this series of harmonics where the second one is an elliptical shape, the third one is a triangular shape, the fourth is a square shape, the fifth is, is, has you know, five sides and six sides and so forth. And so we can break apart our fluid dynamics, both from that initial shape to the final shape and measure that experimentally. And so I give you an example of kind of what that looks like. We have this elliptical shape here and there's triangle shape. They're all kind of like overlaid on top of each other, but we can separate them out mathematically and do direct comparisons between theory and experiment. So now why, why is that a signature for the quark moon plasma? You might wonder. Well, fluid dynamics has very specific ways that it takes that shape from the initial to the final state. And that is a prediction, the way it takes that. If you had something that was a really bad fluid, right, that had an elliptical shape initially, it's not gonna move much and it's just gonna kind of spread out. It will basically ruin all of that shape. It would just end up looking round at the end of the day. Whereas if it's a good fluid, it's gonna push that shape in the other direction. And so that's how we know that we have a nearly perfect fluid. And this is done in other fields. Going back to this idea of the cosmic microwave background, this is how they learn a lot about the early universe. And they also take some sort of harmonic series from the Big Bang and they learn, they, they decompose it, they separate into these different harmonics. Um, and that's how they learn about the early universe. And we can do an analogy within um, the quark gluon plasma is we do some sort of harmonic series and then we basically play with our viscosity. We put in a bigger one or a smaller one and we compare it to data. And this helps us to understand how much viscosity we have in our system. And, and this is something that we can then extract from, from data, from experiments. And so this in fact is something that, that my group did is we did simulations and we made a prediction because this is a, a foundation of good science is you don't just compare today and say, okay, this is the answer, but you need to make predictions and then test those predictions to see if they actually work. And in fact, we were able to do this is that the Large Hadron Collider changed their energy that they hit particles together with. Um, and then we, we did a fluid dynamic simulation compared directly to data and it worked extremely well. We were able to, to make a prediction at the 1% level and be have it confirmed by data. Um, and so what you're seeing here in the plot are the different harmonics. This V2 is the elliptical shape one here. You have uh, V3, which is the triangular shapes here. And you have uh, V4, which is the square shapes here. Now, what the difference in the plots is depending on if these two nuclei hit each other head on or if they kind of hit in the side, or if they're barely just barely touching each other, you end up getting different shapes. And this is something that we understand quite well from theory to experiment comparisons. So this is one of the really key signatures, most successful signatures of the quark gluon plasma. I think this is something we have a really good handle on. Certainly there's still open questions in the field, but we have a really good feeling of how this changes and how we can make predictions and compare it to data. Now there's another very fundamental signature of the quark gluon plasma, 
This is something called energy loss. So to give you an idea is I'm going to uh, drop this ball into water. And you might know just intuitively, if you're walking through air versus walking through water, it's much harder to walk through water, right? It's like you slow down. And so it's the same sort of concept here is you're losing more energy going through water. You can see here, the ball stops right at the end. It hits the water and just gets stuck. This is the idea of energy loss. And this is another thing that we can measure within the quark gluon plasma. So what happens is that you have within the quark gluon plasma, you have jets that are produced. This is, this is something that's a little bit complicated. I won't get into the details, but it comes directly from quantum chromodynamics is you have these really fast moving high momentum jets. And you can see an example here, if you had one jet that's produced at the edge and doesn't go through the quark gluon plasma, it has a lot of particles, has a lot of energy coming out. But if in the other direction, you have a, a, another jet that has to pass through the quark gluon plasma, it's losing energy as it has to go through this, this dense, strongly interacting fluid. Um, and so how can we understand that intuitively a little bit better? Just imagine, you know, it's pre-COVID time and you have to walk through this very, very dense crowd. As you walk through the crowd, you're gonna get bumped around over time. And you're gonna lose energy. You're gonna feel tired, right? Trying to get through this massive crowd. It's the same sort of thing of when you have a jet going through the quark gluon plasma, is it loses energy going through this dense um, liquid. And so this is another thing that we've been able to measure and we can make predictions for. This was a prediction that was confirmed from the experiment. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the details of what this plot means, but the idea here is that if the answer is one, there's absolutely no energy loss. But if you get a very small value, it means you have a large energy loss. And this is some data from the CMS collaboration at the Large Hadron Collider. And you can see that we can, we can make a prediction from theory and have it confirmed experimentally that we kind of know how much these jets are losing energy as they go through through this, this quark gluon plasma. Now what's going on for the future is we've learned a lot about quark gluon plasma from experiments here on Earth. We can't really study the early universe due to, to limitations that we have with cosmology. Maybe one day we'll be able to do that, but we don't have the tools right now to do that. That being said, that for the future, there's a potential that there could be a quark gluon plasma inside a neutron star merger. And that's really exciting. Um, there, they would also use fluid dynamic equations. It's also moving at the speed of light. However, they also have to worry about general relativity. Gravity matters enormously for neutron star mergers. And so this is a very much an open question um, in the field. We don't know if there's a quark gluon plasma. It reaches really high temperatures. Uh, but it's very different than the properties of what you would measure in the laboratory. It could be actually much more dense than the ones that we measure in the laboratory. We also have to wonder, like, how does gravity affect everything? And those are questions that we just don't really know right now. But it's an interesting thing and it's an exciting thing that's going on right now that a lot of people are very curious about. So with that, I reached my summary. Um, Hopefully I've convinced you that the smallest building blocks of matter are these quarks and gluons, and they can interact via the strong force. Right after the, the Big Bang, we did have an entire universe full of the quark gluon plasma, but this is extraordinarily hard to study. So instead we turn to nuclear experiments at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. This is in, on Long Island in New York, or the Large Hadron Collider, which is in Switzerland. And in these experiments, we can reproduce the quark gluon plasma and we fulfill a lot of signatures. We can make nice predictions and compare them directly to data um, to understand that that is really what we're seeing. And also that this quark gluon plasma, it's a very cool fluid. It's the smallest, hottest, most perfect fluid that humanity has ever made. And there's so much more that we can learn from it. So thank you for your time on this Saturday morning and I'm happy to answer any other questions. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, let's, uh, there's several more questions. Let's uh, just get right into it. So uh, there's several uh, black hole questions. Guy asks, can black hole mergers be described with fluid dynamics? I think you might have um, kind of gone through that briefly in the intro. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I don't do much with, with black holes. So I take everything I say there with a grain of salt. But um, from what I understand, yes, they can also be described um, from some sort of fluid dynamic simulation, but this is definitely very dependent on how you do um, 
gravity in there, like general relativity and stuff. So, so this is this is something a bit beyond my own expertise. Yeah, yeah, and kind of you know this probably is too, but um, this is kind of an interesting what if question. Clint asks, what would happen if you threw a quark gluon plasma in a black hole? I know atoms get ripped to pieces, but what about the other things that make atoms up? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I don't think we have a good answer, but there are people that are thinking about this because um, it could be, uh, it's okay, it's a little hard to explain this necessarily in general terms, but uh, when we think about neutron stars, it could be that we don't have a quark gluon plasma within a neutron star. And in fact, the densities that we would need to reach a quark gluon plasma would be in the territory of a black hole. So there are some people that think maybe inside a black hole, you could have like a quark gluon plasma, but then you couldn't really measure it, right? Because we have to deal with the event horizon and all of these complicated things. But there are some people thinking about this. Uh, I don't have a good answer because, you know, we can't really do any measurements of this. Yep, yep, yep. All right. This is a question I, I especially like having a material science background. Uh, why use gold ions, you know, when you're talking about the experimental setup as opposed to um, some other ionic beam? I'm assuming it has yeah. to do with the kind of the characteristic of gold, you know? Oh, yeah, that's a fantastic question. I, I mostly talk about gold because then I could say reverse alchemy. <laughs> so, yeah. in fact, we, we use many different types of ions. Um, we, we chose gold initially because it's a very heavy ion and we wanted a large system. This goes back to the idea of the Knudsen numbers that we want a large separation scales. So we wanted to get a nucleus as big as possible. Uh, in fact, we've, we've used uranium, we've used lead as well. So these are kind of our big systems. We're now actually going into different smaller ions. So we've ran xenon, which has been pretty cool. And there's, there's actually entirely new physics that has come from that. Uh, we're going to probably run oxygen soon. We've ran helium, deuteron, and, and protons, in fact, have potentially signatures as well of a quark gluon plasma. Um, but that has really gotten to the point where we have to kind of go back to the drawing board and understand fluid dynamics if it's in a proton proton collision because it's such a tiny fluid. Uh, mm -hmm. There's many questions there. Yep. And then Marco is kind of going off of uh, Ariane's question. What would happen? You know, what happens if you use something other than gold? Uh, he's, he has perhaps something radioactive. I don't know if that would affect anything. Question mark. Yeah, so the, the radioactive part doesn't really affect anything because these are going at so fast. Um, uh, the speed of light, but basically they're basically just kind of hitting each other and they dump a bunch of energy. So the properties, for most of the properties, not all of them, of the nucleus don't play that big of a role. That being said, uh, one thing about uranium specifically that's quite interesting is that it's no longer a round nucleus, but it looks like a football. And that is something that we can measure. Remember these like geometrical shapes that we were talking about? Um, once it has some sort of geometry to it, that is something we can measure. And in fact, we've been much more recently using these sort of fluid dynamic um, simulations comparing to data to understand the shape of different nuclei. Um, okay. and, and in fact, you can think of very tiny ones like helium-3 that's, that's like a triangle and we can measure that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so Spencer asks, why are these plasmas strange? Are charm particles more stable? Ah, okay, good question. So um, they're strange because when you have deconfined quarks and gluons, you it's much more easy to produce strange particles. Um, so, so basically what can happen is you have a gluon and it, it splits apart into a strange anti-strange particle. And this happens a lot at really, really high temperatures. And so that's why it's so strange is you, is you produce a lot of strange particles. Um, in terms of like charm and bottom and top, in fact, we produce all of those as well, but they have to be produced at really, really high temperatures. So very early on. And just from conservation of energy and momentum, it's much harder to produce them because they're very, very heavy. So you only have a certain fixed amount of energy and to produce something like that, you need a lot of energy. So we don't produce very many of them. Um, so, so we definitely have them there. And, and there's a lot of interesting physics that is involved that I didn't really kind of get into with these heavier particles, um, but it's, it's not as many as the strange or the light particles. Okay, okay. And Spencer also asks, you know, you were talking about those low viscosities. Do you have any issues of containment with viscosity that low? I'm um, not sure if what he means by that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure quite what he means by that. I don't know if he wanted to follow Yeah, up. Spencer, if you want to unmute. 
Sure thing. Um, I had learned that really low temperature fluids with low viscosities mm -hmm. are difficult con to contain and can move outside of their container. I was wondering oh, if okay. that or if it was completely contained in a magnetic field or something like that. Okay, so, um, right. So in this case, yeah, it's it's not so much, there's, there's two reasons why it's not an issue for us. One is these things are extremely, extremely tiny, right? So this is on the scale of 10 to the minus 15 meters. Um, and so it's, it's, it's something very, very tiny. So to, to escape from its container, it, it doesn't really affect us because of this very, very tiny scale. Um, the other thing that happens is these are not experiments that we're doing like here at Loomis. These are experiments that are done at the Little Arch Hadron Collider and Rick that are um, typically underground tunnels, right? So they're, they're not anything that humans are going to get exposed to, but they're, you know, very heavily um, uh, uh, contained already within these tunnels. And then we have very specific, you know, lots of protection and stuff from this. Like you wouldn't want to go down in these tunnels when, when the experiments are running. Um, but but they, they have a lot of safety precautions in place. I, I'm a theorist, so I can't tell you very well all the details of, of what goes into those safety precautions, but I know they have thousands of experiments working on these, the experimentalists working on these, these tunnels and everything and watching to make sure it's safe. So we have a lot of um, precautions in place for them. Yeah, I guess, you know, for more information, you should tune in next Saturday Physics on December 5th. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have an experimental physicist from Fermi. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, S. Cox asked, do cork gluon plasmas have any properties similar to Bose-Einstein condensate? Ah, OK. So um, that is an interesting question. Um, one thing that we have been looking into in more recent uh, years is, is more comparing um, cork gluon plasma to cold atoms, specifically. Um, in this sense, because you can get a nearly perfect liquid, and it's something where you can measure, um, like in the lab, right? And you can take pictures of it, and you can see how it evolves over time. Um, it, there are definitely differences uh, between what you can measure, you know, in like cold atoms or something in the lab, because it's not it's not relativistic, it's not really high temperatures, but it's more that we're looking at stuff like the the nearly perfect fluidity of it. Um, and so from that, we can draw a lot of analogies between the two systems and, and check fluid dynamic equations. Although again, there's, there's certain caveats there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're running up to the end. I think Clint might have one more question. Have you tried running hydrogen? Did you, did you mention hydrogen as one of the ions? Um, have we ran hydrogen? I mean, we run just a proton, right? So that would yeah, be yeah, yeah, protons, yeah. Concept. I, I, for me, uh, hydrogen is just one proton, right? Yeah. That's the way I think of things. So we move all, remove all the electrons. Yep. All right. So I think that looks like pretty much it. Um, I'll continue on the line and mm -hmm. we'll um, use kind of the same link for the student Q&A panel. But, um, you know, thank you so much, um, you know, one last time uh, to Professor Jackie Narona Hostler for giving me a, a great, a great presentation. And I know, you know, she has many other responsibilities and, and kids at home. So I, I really do appreciate um, her taking time out of her busy schedule. So um, for those of you who, who want to tune in at, at noon, we're going to have a student panel uh, for high school students wanting um, and interested in majoring in physics. So thank you so much. And, and I'm happy to talk to anyone um, that, that wants to talk to me, um, you know, from now until, until noon. So thank Thanks, you so Pat. much. Have, have a great Saturday. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing then. Yep.